my name is Thank you all very much for coming. This very beautiful Saturday night in Melbourne. Uh, we started this yesterday, part one. This is part two this evening. As I explained yesterday, I think some of you weren't here, so just briefly. So, I was trained in photography in uh, college, so when I became a devotee, I am Carl Pat engaged me very kindly in using photography in the service of Thank you. I was taking pictures of him and his followers. In uh, the United States, Canada, Europe, and also India. After the BBT was formed, they wanted a photographer to travel with Prabhupada at all times so they had a, a record of his activities. So I was blessed to be one of those photographers. There were three of us. So yesterday we covered uh, Prabhupada and I for and Rakhidanta Manor, United States. So continuing. I might mention that it was very challenging to organize these photographs. Usually when I make presentations, I use the photographs from all of the photographers. But I was requested earlier this year to make a slideshow of my photographs. So this is that slideshow. I took about 90% of the photographs you'll be seeing. And uh, it's challenging to organize them, because if you organize them in terms of years, repeatedly we would go back to the same place. We would go back to Bombay, go back to New York City. And so, you know, you'd have pictures of Bombay, then something else, and then Bombay and something else. So then you can organize them by place, which is more what I did by place rather than by years. And another way of organizing them, of course, is by content. Because everywhere he went, Prabhupada went on morning walks, for example, and gave lectures and met with people. So that's another way of organizing. So it's a bit of a challenge how to organize these. But these pictures, this one was taken in Jayapur. Two of Prabhupada's disciples, Koshalya Devidasi and Srimati Devidasi, went to Jayapur to get deities for New York. And uh, when they were there, actually, we can see the screen better if we turn off these lights also. We had that experience yesterday. If you could turn off um, the, the other lights. Is that okay? Uh, well... It's up to you. I mean, I, I can see the <laughs> I can see the pictures, but it's really up to you. <laughs> so two devotees went to Jayapur to have deities made, marble deities for New York. And when they were there, they found there was tremendous enthusiasm of the part of the residents of Jayapur for Prabhupada and his movement. And uh, they those residents of Jayapur, Hare Krishna. asked those two devout devotees to invite Prabhupada to come. So he did come. And uh, there was a wonderful procession through Jayapur that you can see here. Prabhupada was carried on this bullock cart through the streets of Jayapur. He looked very noble there. And then there was a big pandal held in Jayapur where the deities were installed. Radha Govinda deities who are worshipped today in Brooklyn, ISKCON. And the installation was done by bathing these small deities. That's Yamuna Devi Dasi, bathing the Utsava deities under Prabhupada's watchful eyes. And Prabhupada understood from this that the large deities 
were installed. And then after that, they were sent from Jayapur to Brooklyn, where they're being worshipped still today. And Prabhupada in Jayapur, he visited a Gaudiya moth that was there. He took darshan of the deities. And he was accompanied by all his uh, disciples. There were about 30 of us there at that time. And during this artsy, the devotees had a very exuberant kirtan. And they were very absorbed in the kirtan. I was watching Prabhupada photographing. And I noticed that Prabhupada was trying to catch someone's eye, but the devotees were absorbed in the kirtan. So he saw that he caught my eye and he asked me to come over. And then because the kirtan was so loud, he spoke right into my ear and he said, do you have any rupees? And I said, no, but I can get some. How much do you want? And he thought for a moment and he said, 20. So I went to a devotee who was standing in the back of the room and I said, Prabhupada wants 20 rupees. <laughs> so he immediately gave me 20 rupees and I handed that to Prabhupada in the front. And Prabhupada folded the rupee note and held it between his hands like this until the conch blew, indicating the end of the arti. And then he took the 20 rupees and he put it in the donation box. So he was observing this etiquette of offering something to the Lord when you come before the Lord. And we all took prasadam also at the Gaudiya Math. They serve very wonderful traditional prasadam there. Prabhupada also regularly visited life members when he toured India. People would invite him to their homes and we would bring the small deities with us at Prabhupada's request and set up an entire altar in the life member's home and offer whatever they cooked. We would offer that to the Lord, the small deities, Utsava deities, and then honor that prasadam with Prabhupada. And afterwards, Prabhupada would sit and talk with the life members. They would have a nice chat if the life members had any questions or wanted advice about something. Prabhupada took the time to develop that relationship. It was very personal. So here we're in Dallas, Texas. Again, Prabhupada regularly would go on these morning walks quite early with a small group of his followers. And it was a wonderful time for exchanges or just chanting japa with Srila Prabhupada. In, uh, he would always go to some natural place, a park or a beach, so he wouldn't be disturbed by the cars. And then he would come back in time to greet the deities at 7 o'clock, along with all his devotees. And after greeting the deities, he would sit on the Vyasa sun. And in Dallas, the students themselves had an opportunity to personally offer flowers to Srila Prabhupada and offer obeisances, of course. In this way, Prabhupada was training a future generation of Vaishnavas. And he also had very personal exchanges with the students. Some of them remember to this day, I just met one of these students in uh, New Govardhan, and she recalls the exchange that she had with Srila Prabhupada, how he requested her to go on chanting the Maha Mantra for her whole life. So when she had this exchange, she was six or seven years old, but it's something that penetrated her heart that she remembers to this day. And she feels that she is still chanting Hare Krishna because Prabhupada made this personal request of her that was so potent. When he arrived, he gave raskulas to each and every student. He started off doing it with a spoon and then he quickly switched and did it by hand. So every student got a raskula from Srila Prabhupada in the hand. 
And this little boy, his name is Ishwara Puri. Today he is the son-in-law of Dina Bandhu Prabhu, who was just here a little while ago. When, uh, when he spoke about this incident, he was in his 20s, recalling this instance of getting a Rasgula from Srila Prabhupada in Dallas, Texas. He said that he got this Rasgula and he dropped it. And his mother is there, Bimala, and she picked it up and gave it back to him. And he said, this has actually been the story of my life, that I repeatedly drop the great gift of Krishna consciousness, and my mother picks it up and gives it back to me. But now he is married to Dina Bandhu Prabhu's daughter, and he's doing very well. His mother has since passed away. That's his mother, the blue, the blue sari. I'm, we could see these much better if we didn't have that other light. I don't know how you feel about it, but you want to try turning off the light? We'll see. You can take a vote. <laughs> the light is shining on, this, on the screen. Is that better? Yeah. So Prabhupada would also spend time to relax and talk with his disciples. These are leading disciples here. On the right is Satsvarup Das Goswami, in the middle is Abhananda, and on the left is Gargamuni. And Prabhupada had a wonderful sense of humor. He could turn a phrase or say a few words and everyone would be delighted and laughing. Timing is very important in humor, and he had expert timing in that, in that way. And he also enjoyed wherever he was, as I mentioned yesterday, he would also take the time to go and see how the devotees were living, to see their different projects. Yesterday we saw the first American theistic exhibit in Los Angeles. Prabhupada spent some time there. So here also devotees had houses in the neighborhood, and Prabhupada would walk and see their homes. Sometimes he would even go in their homes to see how they were living. And he did a tremendous, as we know, he did a tremendous amount of traveling. In the West, he would spend just a few days in each place and then move on. He did not personally get involved in management, but he left that to his disciples. Whereas in India, it was quite different. He would spend weeks and sometimes months in one place and get deeply involved in the management. It was quite a different experience. He was very conscious of time. He went to the airports early, so he didn't have to rush once he got there. And he spent uh, most of his speaking time expressing different aspects of Krishna consciousness so he could learn to understand it from different points of view and apply Krishna consciousness in different circumstances. So sometimes we don't think about the responsibility Prabhupada took on on behalf of his spiritual master, but it was an enormous responsibility and it grew year by year as more disciples came and there was more activity and more centers being opened. But through it all, Prabhupada remained very personal, taking time with his disciples, not being stressed or rushed. It was a wonderful example for us how to handle these responsibilities in very fixed Krishna conscious way. In those years, we could it was before 9-11, of course, so we could go directly to the gate, which we al always did and sat with Prabhupada until his plane departed and he boarded the plane. And that also was a wonderful time to have exchanges with him. The devotees could gather and just ask questions or experience being in his presence and also experience a little bit of his humor. In the airports, 
The devotees would be distributing Prabhupada's books when he arrived or departed. And on one occasion, a gentleman took a book and the devotee book distributor said, would you like to meet the author of this book? And the man was not rushed and he said, okay. And so he actually sat with Srila Prabhupada and had a little exchange with the author of the book that he had just purchased in the airport. There was also an occasion, Prabhupada was flying from Philadelphia to Berkeley, and for whatever reason, there were very few passengers on the plane, and the captain of the airplane allowed his co-pilot to fly the plane, and he came back and sat next to Srila Prabhupada, and they had a wonderful discussion. I was, at that time, I was filming, and because of the noise of the plane, and I was a little bit a distance, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was a very animated conversation. So afterwards, I was too shy to ask Prabhupada, what you speak about? And I thought I would never know. But when Prabhupada got to Berkeley, in his arrival address, he talked about this conversation he and the captain had had. And he said the captain was very intelligent. And he said to Prabhupada, one question he asked is, if God is all good, why is there evil in the world? This is a question that has puzzled theologians for centuries now. And Prabhupada pointed out that for God, there is no evil. Evil is compared to the backside of God, irreligion, and the universal form of God. The description is that irreligion is his back. So whether the back or the front, it's all part and parcel of God. It's all part of God. So then the captain asked, so why do we experience evil if there's no evil from God's point of view? And Prabhupada gave an analogy, a very powerful analogy. He said that if you're standing directly under the sun, there's no shadow. But as soon as you turn your back to the sun, you create a shadow. So similarly, for God, there's no evil. But if we turn our backs to God, then we create evil. We are the creators of evil. So and then he said in this arrival lecture, he said, is that all right? And all the devotees cheered because it's such a clear explanation. It was very satisfying. So in this way, Prabhupada related himself this wonderful discussion he had with the captain of this airplane. Then when he arrived, all the devotees from all the temples in the area would come and fill the airport. There'd be no room for the other passengers and they would be sometimes offering incense, offering garlands, offering ghee lamps. For the Western Westerners in the airport, it was a very bizarre experience. And of course, kirtan. And the devotees also would invite reporters to come for the occasion, saying the founder acharya of the Hare Krishna movement is arriving. And so reporters from newspapers or Television studios would come to record the event. Sometimes there were interviews in the airport. If you've seen the Hare Krishna film, you may have seen there's an interview. The reporter is asking, if everyone in the United States became Krishna conscious, what would it be like? And Prabhupada said, oh, they would be very peaceful and happy. There will be no more hippies. So the reporter said, so what is a hippie? And Prabhupada said, you know better than I, something, something extraordinary. <laughs> that happened in the airport during the arrival. And the devotees were so happy to be with Prabhupada again, exuberant. Prabhupada, they would have a car waiting, and the devotees would see him right from the gate to his car, and he would drive to the temple. 
So yesterday I read a little bit from the conversations Prabhupada had with Dr. Patel on Juhu Beach. And then also we heard um, Prabhupada's conversation with a reporter in New York City. So today at the risk of being self-indulgent, I also wanted to read, but this is from my memoir that I wrote about touring with Srila Prabhupada in the United States and Canada. It's just one page. So excuse my self-indulgence. More in the US and Canada than in India, I began pulsating with the excitement and energy that Prabhupada's followers in the West exuded. Prabhupada's high expectations of us, me and all his followers, were a thermal of hope that propelled us to meet those expectations, that is, to become more aware of God and to act accordingly. The soaring nature of my ambitions and how far I was from realizing them regularly eluded me. Along with the others, I overflowed with vibrant possibilities that felt at once strange, yet also natural. But really, what did Prabhupada actually do when he came to a temple on these summer tours? In the early morning, he'd translate and comment on the scriptures. At sunrise, he'd go for a walk with a small cadre. He'd return to have darshan of the deities. He'd sing Jairata Madhava and give a short philosophical talk in the temple room. He'd write letters and meet with guests and devotees in his room. Not glamorous activities, yet we followers were beside ourselves. What was happening was what Yamuna Devi had years ago termed Krishna's magic, the forceful inner glow of the supremely better life available to us propelled us toward ecstasy. Swept up in Prabhupada's bright sea of possibility, my heart filled with a song of delight. I pared down my camera equipment to fit whatever would fit in a small case that forever draped from my right shoulder and in a black canvas shoulder bag that hung from my left shoulder, I kept a straw sleeping mat, pajamas, toiletries, a towel, and a change of clothes. This left me free of baggage check-ins and claims and allowed me to stay with Prabhupada throughout his airport departures and arrivals, the most emotional parts of his tour, where despite the monolithic glass and steel confines, the devotee's face is shone with an otherworldly other love, the awakened energy of their souls. To the astonishment of onlookers, terminals in major American cities were backdrops for the boundless exhilaration of meetings and separations, and all worldly power and glory did not equal the devotee's exuberance within these modern day gateways. So I tried to convey a little flavor of what it was like and also through the photographs for all these devotees to come together to meet their life and soul, Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly gave them Krishna consciousness and awoken them to genuine spiritual life. Here, when the car arrives, he's being greeted by devotees in the San Diego temple. So these are his homes that he created throughout the world for his followers, for the Lord. And he was very personal. It wasn't just that he was interested in his leading devotees, but he was interested in the well-being spiritually and materially of all his followers. This is in Washington, D.C., Potomac, Maryland. This young woman has done a illustrated, illuminated Bhagavad Gita. She's an artist and she wants Prabhupada's approval for this book, Illuminations of the Bhagavad Gita. Her name is Kim Waters. So she took some of the pages to Prabhupada and showed them to him in his room in Potomac, Maryland. And Prabhupada very carefully observed them 
and then gave his approval. Since it's been published as a book, Illuminations of Bhagavad Gita. And here Prabhupada is seeing photographs taken in one of his centers that behind him smiling is Narahari from Hawaii. And the New York temple in Manhattan on 55th Street, the devotees had a restaurant. And when Prabhupada toured the building, he also observed the restaurant. Not only what they were serving, but the kitchen facilities as well. And in New York and other places, the devotees would put on plays based on the pastimes Prabhupada describes in his books, Krishna's pastimes. And Prabhupada very much relished these plays. There was one devotee who was a professional actress. Her name was Rasa Gya. And when they perform the play, Krishna kidnaps Rukmini. Rasa Gya was describing that although she was trained in acting and had acted professionally for some years before she became a devotee, when she was going to perform as Rukmini, she was feeling very unconfident because she says Rukmini is the expansion of Krishna, the goddess of fortune. How can I play Rukmini? But because of her training, the show must go on. So the show did go on and uh, she performed amazingly as Rukmini. Every eye movement, every motion of her body, we could completely understand that this was Rukmini. We were very much absorbed in the pastime. And at the end, Prabhupada said, yes, she has played the best. He also was very moved by her, her performance and her absorption. She was really absorbed in that Leela. So in 55th Street, they had a, uh, an auditorium where the devotees performed on stage and Prabhupada came also to see that play was uh, about Kali. And uh, Kali's agents, lust, anger, greed, envy, illusion, and madness. And wherever Prabhupada went during these uh, times, of course, the devotees would take the opportunity to offer their obeisances to him and pray for his mercy upon them. In 1970, the first group of devotees went from the West to India. We spoke about that a little bit yesterday. At first, there were no temples in India. Prabhupada's spiritual master had asked him to preach Krishna consciousness to the English-speaking people of the world. And Prabhupada did that with extraordinary success, as we know in the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe. But he also wanted to reignite Krishna consciousness among the people of India because they were being very much influenced by the Western ways, thinking that they would make progress if they imitated the West. So Prabhupada brought his Western disciples back to India to show the Indian people that in the West, the people want what you have, the culture that you have. And the Indian people generally were astonished to see Westerners wearing their traditional dress, eating their diet, chanting the holy names of God that they had learned from their scriptures. And this was, became a very effective means of propagating Krishna consciousness in the West. So at these pandals, there would be 10,000, 15,000 on the weekend, 20,000 people who would come to hear from Prabhupada and to see these Western devotees chanting and dancing. And the devotees would invite prominent people. This is the Canadian High Commissioner who came to our Delhi Pandal program. And he, he spoke before Prabhupada spoke with his appreciations of what Prabhupada had done in Canada. Prabhupada had centers in Montreal and Toronto and Vancouver. So the High Commissioner expressed his appreciation also at the Delhi Pandal, the mayor of Delhi came because Prabhupada had created 
these centers in the West, the people of India, were paying attention now to what he was doing. When he had preached in India, he was largely ignored. When he had this kind of success in the West, the prominent people of India came forward to, to help him and to support his efforts. Here you can see one of these pandals with all these people in attendance. You, from here, you, you cannot see the extent of it on the left and right, but it was thousands and thousands of people every night would come. After the first pandal in Delhi, which is where these prominent people had spoken, Prabhupada took the small group of us to Vrindavan. And on the way, his car broke down, so he came on the bus with us. You can see him there at the head of the bus as our, our guide. And we toured Vrindavan. We went to Brasana. And at first, the devotees thought that professionals should not carry Prabhupada's palaquin. As you may know, there are many, many steps leading up to the Brasana temple. So to help those who cannot climb all those steps, they have this palaquin carried by professional palaquin carriers. So here, Prabhupada's disciples are carrying the palaquin, but because they were not professional, Prabhupada was swaying back and forth in the palaquin. So then he said, no, the professionals should carry it. So then the professionals took over. <laughs> and here we're high up on the, on the hilltop in Bursana. And Prabhupada stayed in Vrindavan for some time. This is in the Radhadamadar temple. That little girl there is Saraswati. She traveled with us. That's Shamsundar and Malati's daughter. Shamsundar is right behind Saraswati, and Malati is behind Shamsundar behind uh, Prabhupada is the proprietor of the Radhadamadar temple. We'll see him a little bit in another slide in a bit. And on the right with the plaid blanket is a devotee called Rishi Kumar. Rishi Kumar was in India. He was the treasurer for some time in the Bombay temple. Then his visa expired, so he could no longer stay in India. So he went to South Africa and tried to preach in South Africa. And at that time, there was no treasure in Bombay. So Prabhupada looked at the few of us who were there, and he said to my husband, you can be treasurer and your wife will help you. And uh, neither my husband nor I can balance a checkbook somehow. I don't know why. So after three days of high anxiety, we went back to Prabhupada and uh, my husband said, uh, the service you've given us is causing us tremendous anxiety. And Prabhupada immediately said, then don't do it. We were very new, and uh, at that time that's what he said. And he himself became the treasurer until a qualified person took over. So he didn't want his devotees, especially the newer devotees, to experience this kind of anxiety and stress in their service. In 1972, Prabhupada returned to Vrindavan. Those other pictures were earlier. This is 1972, Kartik. Prabhupada spent one month there, and he's seated in the courtyard of the Radhadamadar temple. He would sit there morning and evening to deliver the discourses. In the morning, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Divinity and Divine Service, and in the evening on Nectar of Devotion. And of course, he would start by singing Jai Radha Madhava. It was a very special time. Uh, you could hear the parrots and the peacocks at that time and in this place. And the pilgrims, the Vrindavan pilgrims, would circumambulate the temple. And as they went, they would chant Jai Radhe. So you can also hear that. There are tapes today of these discourses that Prabhupada delivered at Radha Damodar in 1972, Kartik. And here he's sitting with his Gorachand. Uh, Gorachand, as I mentioned, was the proprietor of the Radha Damodar temple, and Prabhupada had a number of issues 
with the way the tempo was being managed. I think today he would also have a number of issues with the way that particular temple is being managed. Now it's managed by his descendants, Gorachand. He's, he's a Grihasta, but because he comes in a line of Goswamis, he calls himself Goswami, but we, don't, we understand Goswami should be reserved for those who are in the renounced order, not for Grihastas. So this was also taken during Kartik, 1972. Jamuna Devi Dasi was cooking for Prabhupada during this month. And one afternoon before Prabhupada's lunch prasadam, she asked him if it would be all right with him if I photographed him before he honored prasadam, and he very kindly agreed. So he's looking out the window at the bhajan kutir and samadhi of Srila Rupa Goswami. And this, of course, was the room that he, or that he has two rooms here, that he lived in before he came to America in 1965. It was in these rooms that he translated the Srimad Bhagavatam from Sanskrit to English. He also did that in Delhi as well. And his morning walks. It was rather chilly, November that year. On the left, the tall devotee on the left is Hayagriva Das, and on the right is Achyutananda. This is the little group sitting in the courtyard of the Radhadamadar temple. Unfortunately, the courtyard is completely different today. And during the day, the devotees would go on Harinam through the streets of Vrindavan, Loi Bazaar. This was before there was a huge influx of monkeys that torment the pilgrims. There were a few monkeys, but nothing like there was today. And in the evening, we would gather again to hear the nectar of devotion spoken by Srila Prabhupada. Some of us thought at this time, since we're in Vrindavan at such a special time, perhaps Prabhupada would tell very sweet pastimes of Radha and Krishna, or the story of Krishna stealing butter. But Prabhupada spoke very basic philosophy, especially in the afternoon, he would have Pradumya. Pradumya is on the right there with the glasses, the second from the right. Pradumya would read a few sentences from the introduction to the nectar of devotion, and then Prabhupada would elaborate on those few sentences. And Prabhupada also walked around Vrindavan, sometimes visiting people that he knew, sometimes taking darshan in the different temples. And he also told us stories. This is the story of how Lord Brahma was bewildered when he captured the cowherd boys and put them in a cave. And then Krishna expanded himself to replicate each cowherd boy exactly, and then revealed his form as Krishna, as each cowherd boy. And Prabhupada is expressing it so graphically with his uh, facial expressions. And we sat, the devotees bathed, and Prabhupada at first said, I'm an old man, the water is very cold, I will just watch as my disciples bathe. And then he decided to actually join them. So that was very wonderful. It was, uh, the sun was warm that day. So as I mentioned yesterday, it was very extraordinary over these few years, and it really was just a few years, especially in India, that Prabhupada would come to a place where there was not even a temple. Uh, in Bombay, we started off in a rented flat. That was our first established temple in Bombay, and then we moved to Juhu, and over the years established Juhu. So Prabhupada also did that in Mayapur, and he also did that in Vrindavan. So here in Vrindavan, when we first went to Vrindavan, we used a house of uh, Mr. Bo we, the Saraf Bhavan, 
Mr. Saraf kindly gave us our house, so we all stayed. Prabhupada and the devotees stayed in Saraf Bhavan. In 1972, when he went, we used Keshigat as a place that the devotees stayed, and Prabhupada stayed in the Radhadamaro temple. Then some land was donated, as we know, in Raman Reti, and Prabhupada started construction of the beautiful Krishna Balaram temple there. So, just over a period of years, it went from no land and no, not even a proper place to stay to this development of this property. And finally, the time came for the installation of the deities at the Krishna Balaram temple. Prabhupada said that um, the real installation is the 24 hour chanting of the Maha Mantra Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But at the same time, in order for the temple to be accepted by the local people, he had Brahmins come and do their installation procedures and mantras. So for part of those installation procedures and mantras, Prabhupada's personal presence was requested by the Brahmins. So this is Prabhupada sitting while the Brahmins around him do their mantras and procedures, very elaborate. And this was a very unusual experience for me as a photographer because, as I mentioned, Prabhupada was very expressive and would be having exchanges continually with the people around him. Uh, and his face would take on so many different features. But during this time when he sat, he was really um, in another place and his face was quite unexpressive. It was quite unique to see him like this. As I mentioned, for him, the installation was the chanting. It was not these mantras, which are meant for a different age and a different time, but simply for the acceptance of the temple for the locals. He went through this, and many important people were invited to the opening ceremonies. For those who know the history, there were many delays in opening this temple. The devotees were not used to constructing things in India. There was a lot of cheating going on. There was a scarcity of concrete, the cement. Uh, so there were many, many delays for months. And finally, when the temple was ready, this is Ram Nomi, uh, all these dignitaries came for the inauguration and spoke. And Prabhupada himself performed the first arti for Sri Sri Krishna Balaram. So there's a story behind this picture that at this time the temple was completely packed with devotees. For those who have been there, they know the temple is not very large. And devotees had come from all over the world as well as special guests. And I felt it was very important for me to take photographs of this historic moment of Prabhupada offering the very first arti to Krishna Balaram. So somehow I wended my way through all these people that were shoulder to shoulder, packed up in the temple, and came to the front. And at that time, there was one person between me and a clear view of Prabhupada, and that was Tripurari Swami. He had just taken sannyas. Tripurari Swami, Prabhupada called him the incarnation of book distribution. He distributed books in the airports in America with tremendous success, and he also inspired and taught others to distribute books. And because he collected so much money for the BBT, a lot of the money that he collected went towards building the Krishna Balaram temple. So he was riveted on this. For him, this was a tremendous victory for Prabhupada that after all the delays, all the struggles, all the obstacles, finally the deities were there, the inauguration was happening, and he was not prepared to move aside. He was riveted on this event unfolding before him. So I tapped him on the shoulder so I could move ahead to get pictures and he ignored me. And then I held my camera over his shoulder pointing at him, the lens pointing at him, trying to indicate that I was trying to do a service. And it was like it didn't happen, it just completely ignored me. So I was becoming increasingly desperate because I felt this was such an important event. And at that time there was a deafening kirtan. 
So I put my mouth right next to Tripurari Swami's ear and I spoke as loudly as I could because of the kirtan. And I said to him, if you stand there, you can see Srila Prabhupada offering the arti. If you let me stand there, the whole world will see Srila Prabhupada offering the arti. So he didn't move. And my desperation... <laughs> My desperation level was increasing. I mean, it was like, I didn't know what I was going to do next, you know. But he took one long last look at Srila Prabhupada, and then without looking at me at all, he slid aside and allowed me to come to the front so I could take a series of pictures. Because in his heart of heart, Tripurari Swami is a preacher. So when I said that, that touched something very deep inside him. It was for preaching. And so I think that moved him, so he moved. <laughs> so by Krishna's grace, these pictures are now available for us to remember this incredible event. These deities were made, Prabhupada sent Jamuna Devi Dasi, she was the head of the deity department. If you've read her book, Yamuna Devi, there's a description of how she went to Jayapur and worked with the uh, Wallas who make the deities. So they, they came out just perfectly. I mean, if, especially if you see Radha Shamsundar and Radharani's face, that's especially elaborated on in the Yamuna Devi book, exactly how in Radharani's face, Radha Shamsundar and Vrindavan just so captivating, it goes right to your heart. And similarly, Krishna and Balaram. So after this wonderful ceremony, we went on a parade through the streets of Vrindavan. Prabhupada must have been exhausted at that time, but still he, he walked through the streets with us. There's also a beautiful story that my god sister Urvasi tells, that she was in California coming to India for the installation of Krishna Balaram and Vrindavan. And before she left California, she visited her mother. And she told her mother what her intention was. <clears throat> she was going to see her spiritual master in India. And her mother was quite attracted to Krishna consciousness. And she said, is there something I can give to your spiritual master you can take with you? So Irvasi thought for a moment and said, well, I think he likes guava jam. So her mother had a guava tree, and her mother made some guava jam and sent a jar of it for Srila Prabhupada with her daughter, Irvasi. So Irvasi gets to Vrindavan, and she gives this jar from her mother to one of Prabhupada's servants. And then she's going on. She's participating in all the activities. And after a day or two, the servant rushes up to her and says, I've been looking everywhere for you. Prabhupada wants to write a letter to your mother thanking her for this jam. She, he wants the address. There was no address. And so Urvasi was commenting that here, there's so many details for Prabhupada to pay attention to in terms of the building, in terms of the guests, in terms of all the devotees that had come, in terms of the celebrations. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people were there. Who knows how many details to take care of. And yet he took the time to write a letter to Urbasi's mother. And in the letter, he said that when he was a child, his mother used to make guava jam for him and how much he appreciated this gift from Urbasi's mother. And he told her that her daughter is in good hands. She doesn't have to worry about her daughter. She's protected and all her needs are provided for. So this was such a treasure for the mother to receive and so personal, very much representative of how Prabhupada dealt very personally with each and every person. There he's taking darshan after the installation during one of the many artis. And after a little while, he laid the cornerstone for what would become the Guruku building right next to the Krishna Balaram temple, 13th September, 1975. And standing in the back, in the white kurta, that's Saurabh. 
Zorab oversaw. He was a graphic designer, an architect, and he came to the Juhu Temple before it was a proper temple. He was traveling in India, searching for something genuine. At that time, his name was Hans. And he was introduced to Prabhupada, who was living in one of the tenant buildings in Juhu. Prabhupada, Prabhupada heard that Saurabh had studied, studied architecture. So he gave Saurabh some paper and pencil, and he sat him down at a table just outside Prabhupada's own room and said he wanted a temple built in Juhu. Please make a design for it. He was still Hans at that time. And Saurabh had only learned architecture theoretically. He had never done it practically. So he, draw, he drew actually very, something very similar to what's in Bombay today with the two circular towers and then the temple attached. And uh, Prabhupada accepted that. And then he also, Prabhupada gave him so many photographs of temples that Prabhupada liked in Vrindavan and he had him design the Krishna Balaram temple also. And so these two temples, especially in Juhu and Vrindavan, were designed by Surab. And to his astonishment, it was not theoretical. After the design, he was responsible also for seeing these temples were erected. And that was a very, very difficult job in India to do that. But Prabhupada, in the end, was very pleased by his service. So here is Prabhupada in front of the Krishna Balaram temple with all his disciples. As I mentioned yesterday, after the morning walk, the temple commander would gather all the devotees. They would be ready for Prabhupada when he returned from his walk to take these group photographs. So we did this everywhere. But Prabhupada himself remained very simple. Here he is in his rooms at Radhadamadar on the right. This is original sannyas danda. And although he started this incredible society throughout the world, he himself hardly ever spoke on the telephone. I was traveled with him for almost six years, and this is the one time in six years that I saw him speak on the telephone. He much preferred to do things by letter because then you have a record of it when you have a letter. Telephone, people mishear, they forget, they're distracted. So he preferred letter to, tele to telephone. This is on a morning walk in Delhi. It was very cold at that time. After the first time we went to Vrindavan, we went to Delhi. And that time was a war between India and Pakistan, December 1971. We, uh, we had to do a complete blackout at night. There on the right is my husband, Yadabara Prabhu. And with the blue cap on. And in the mornings on his walk, we would have the streets to ourselves. There'd be no cars, no other pedestrians. And Prabhupada here is pa pausing at a uh, newspaper rack, and he's reading the headlines to see the progress of the war. This is a fairly well-known picture, but people do not know that he's reading <laughs> the newspaper headlines to see how the war between India and Pakistan was progressing. On the Calcutta temple, Prabhupada's taking darshan, Radha Govinda. The temple is in the same place today at 3 Albert Road. And then he sits on his Vyasasana and gives a discourse. On the right there, that model, that was the first model of the temple of the Vedic planetarium that was constructed under Prabhupada's direction by his own disciples. And then sitting on the right is Giriraj Das Brahmachari at the time. And there was initiation at this time. This was in October of 1971. Bhavananda was doing the ceremony. And again, you can see that model of the temple of the Vedic Platitarium behind. And the person with his back to the camera and his arm in the air, um, 
the Western person, that's my husband. He was getting initiated at this time. Also at this initiation ceremony, Janani Vas Prabhu, who's the Pujari Par Excellence in Mayapur, he's been there forever. He was also initiated at the same ceremony. So in Calcutta, there were many, many problems in the temple. The devotees couldn't figure out how to cook in an Indian kitchen, so they hired what was supposed to be a Brahmin cook, but he was neither a Brahmin nor a cook. <laughs> so also the devotees got cheated as far as the ingredients, the boga, and the cooking was inferior. Devotees were falling sick. They were arguing with each other. The temple was never convincingly clean. So at one point, one of the residents there, his name was Devananda Swami, he was describing to Srila Prabhupada in Prabhupada's room in Calcutta all the various problems in the Calcutta temple. And I took a series of pictures at that time of Prabhupada listening as he hears about these very serious problems in his temple in Calcutta. And afterwards, I printed these pictures and showed them to Prabhupada, and his comment was, she has captured the mood. <laughs> so my understanding at that time was that Prabhupada was not unaware of our difficulties, of our austerities, and he expected us to rise above them, to tolerate, and also to correct those problems. And he himself very much did that, that he would always remain on a higher platform than these petty problems that we meet from day to day. And at the same time, he would deal with them. So when both things were going on at once. And with training and with practice, he expected us to do the same thing. You solve the problem, but you also realize this material world is a place of problems. Ultimately, there's the problem of birth and death and disease and old age. And the way to solve that is to become Krishna conscious. So we don't spend all our energy and time solving problems, but we do try to come to this platform of Krishna consciousness so that in the end, all our problems will be solved permanently. And Prabhupada was a great exemplar of that, remaining on the transcendental platform while also dealing in this material world in a very practical way. And as mentioned in the Hare Krishna film, for those who have seen it, it's uh, made very clear that Prabhupada would receive letters every day, sometimes many letters because he had so many disciples. And these letters would be expressing various challenges the devotees would be having. Prabhupada took the time to answer each and every letter with both practical guidance and instructions, as well as spiritual inspiration. So these letters can be read today and we can get great guidance and fortitude, spiritual fortitude from these writings. Here Prabhupada is taking darshan of the deities that he worshipped as a child or observed the worship of, I should say. This was right across the street from his home where he grew up in Calcutta. And his mother would take him there and he would see the arti ceremony for Radha Govinda. At this time, Prabhupada spoke to a small group of men who had gathered. And ordinarily, Prabhupada spoke for 40 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, when he gave class in the temple. There were not long classes. But this was the one time he spoke in Bengali, and he spoke for an hour and a half. And I couldn't understand it, because unfortunately, I don't speak Bengali. But I took a series of pictures. They're not included here. But in each picture that I took, <clears throat> the gentlemen who were listening to him were just riveted on what he had to say. They would be in different positions. Sometimes they'd be standing. Sometimes they'd be sitting. They would move around. But each time, they're just completely absorbed in Prabhupada's words. So this is my husband behind Prabhupada. As I mentioned, these morning walks were a wonderful time to be with Prabhupada in these quiet places. Here he's walking on the campus, the University of Berkeley. And the devotees told him 
that the students at the university are sometimes so stressed by the pressure of going to the university that some of them would climb into this clock tower behind and jump to their suicide. And Prabhupada was so hurt to hear these unnecessary deaths due to ignorance. Sometimes Prabhupada would simply walk and chant, and sometimes he would simply walk without discourse. This is in Mayapur. Again, it was so early in the morning, it was not much light. And sometimes it'd be very wonderful exchanges between Prabhupada and the, uh, the devotees. And Prabhupada used the opportunity to make emphatic points, impressing the devotees with the logic and the science of Krishna consciousness, the practical application of Krishna consciousness. On this occasion, there was great competition amongst the devotees for being the best group to distribute books. So Tamal Krishna Goswami was the head of the Radhadamadar bus party, and he often got first place, him, him and his party, for the amount of books distributed. But this morning, Rameshwar, who was just to the right of Prabhupada, smiling with glasses, he was telling Prabhupada that Ridayananda Maharaj, who was on the left there, he's being very successful distributing books in South America and he may be number one in book distribution. And Prabhupada commented, don't tell Tamal Krishna Goswami because he may have a heart attack. <laughs> so that's the picture here. All the devotees were laughing at the surprising, surprising statement. <laughs> Here Prabhupada is telling a story. You can see from his expressions. And here on the right is Sarup Damodar. He also became a sannyasi and initiating spiritual master. He was a PhD. And Prabhupada started this Bhaktivedanta Institute because Prabhupada realized how much influence the scientists have on the modern consciousness and he wanted his scientific disciples, who were qualified in many ways, to counter all the effects of the scientists on the modern consciousness. So he spent a lot of time talking to these scientists. There was a small group of them, how to introduce Krishna consciousness through scientific principles and convince the people that this is also a science and a science that's far superior to the material sciences that they're being so taken away by. Here also on the left, his name is Madhava. He's also a PhD. He was one part of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, trained personally by Prabhupada, how to preach to the scientists. Prabhupada said that this flower, this Kadamba flower, it's the color of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This on the right is Madira. She was married to a devotee named Tejas, who was the president of the Delhi temple. And Tejas had a little bit of trouble getting along with people, including his wife. Sometimes they would argue, and Prabhupada would listen to Tejas Tejas would say, my wife does not listen to me. And Prabhupada at one point said, your wife is very intelligent. Perhaps you should listen to her. <laughs> this is on a morning walk in Vishakhapatnam. As I mentioned, Malati, who's there just to the left of Prabhupada, her daughter came with us to India. And Prabhupada and Saraswati, her daughter, had a very wonderful, loving relationship. 
Saraswati enjoyed garlanding Prabhupada, and Prabhupada enjoyed garlanding Saraswati. This is on Bhaktivedanta Manor in the lawn. And here we are in Berkeley again after the morning walk. All the devotees have gathered and taken the Vyasasan outside. This was a magnificent Vyasasan. And as I mentioned also, the Radhadamadar traveling bus party. Those are the Radhadamadar deities, Prabhupada sitting on the red mat on the left. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj is there. The four buses would travel throughout America and Canada, filled with brahmacharis. And every day, all day, they would distribute books and magazines and have kirtan also. This was in Chicago. There was a huge initiation. About 70 devotees became initiated. And they installed Gornitai deities to travel on those buses with them. After he lectured in the morning, Prabhupada would have the children come up and he would give them cookies, a cookie into the hand of each and every child. So in this way, he exchanged with the children as well as with the adults. At one point, Brahmananda, who was Prabhupada's secretary at that time, he thought Prabhupada got up at two in the morning, he translated, he took a very long, brisk walk, and he greeted the deities, he gave a discourse, surely he's tired, he wants to rest. So he told Prabhupada, I'll distribute the cookies and you can go to your room. And Prabhupada said, no, I want to distribute the cookies. <laughs> so after the uh, morning program, Prabhupada would take prasadam. Sometimes he took with the devotees, but most often he would just take himself very quietly. And sitting in the Detroit temple, he heard there was a, at that time there were peacocks there. When the peacocks cawed their special caw, Prabhupada said, he is also chanting. It's wonderful that whether Prabhupada was in front of 20,000 people or just alone in his room, he was the same. He was absorbed in Krishna consciousness. They had a recording studio, Golden Avatar. Prabhupada made some recordings there that can be heard today of bhajans by the great acharyas. He had trouble finding a murdanga player that he appreciated, so he himself would play the murdanga on another track. He would hear the recording and then play the murdanga in time. And as I mentioned, in the early, early mornings, he would translate Srimad Bhagavatam. It was very, very special to go in his rooms at that time. My husband would film and I would photograph when it was an especially sanctified moment. Prabhupada so focused on the Sanskrit and the uh, words of the previous acharyas and presenting that just for our understanding in this day and this age. And this is the Detroit temple. Again, the devotees have gathered and it's a very nice time of day for lighting. The Vyasa sun is lit up by the sunlight, morning sunlight. And it was here that Prabhupada met with Ambarish, who is the great grandson of Henry Ford, the car magnet. He's on the, the right there underneath the bookshelf. And it was at this moment that Prabhupada said that he was building this temple of the Vedic planetarium in Mayapur. And he asked Ambarish, what do you think of the idea? And Ambarish said, it sounds like a wonderful idea. And Prabhupada said, then you can help. 
So at that moment, this picture was taken. And as we know, Ambarish has helped enormously with that project. This is in the 55th Street building, this 11-story building in the heart of Manhattan. Here the devotees are hanging out the windows and on the roof and Prabhupada. It's that tiny red dot on the balcony there. That was the pic previous picture in his, uh, on his Vyasa song. Potomac, Maryland. This also is in Potomac. And it was here that Prabhupada gathered his PhD disciples, who are shown here. Uh, on the left is Sadaputta. The boy is Rupanuga's son. And Sadaputta and Srupadamadar, also on the left. And on the right is Rupanuga with the hat and Madhava. So these were the people from the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And Prabhupada felt that it was very important that they preach to the scientists and establish Krishna consciousness in the scientific community. And he went from Potomac to Baltimore just to take darshan of Gornitai there. It's not a long way. But Prabhupada wanted to encourage the devotees in Baltimore. So as the founder and acharya of our movement, we can all feel related to Srila Prabhupada and inspired by him and under his shelter. Prabhupada was very keen that books properly present Krishna consciousness. From time to time, people would give him books and very often he would be disappointed by the philosophy presented in the books. On this particular occasion, he was quite pleased, though. Where is that? This is in the Emily Tamal, Emily Tamal Tal Temple in Vrindavan, Emily Tala Temple. Prabhupada was invited there for prasadam at this point. And it was a very wonderful exchange he had. He knew the people there quite well. This is again in Dallas. My husband and I wanted to do a film about the Hare Krishna movement. And for that film, we wanted to recreate the Rathiatra that Prabhupada celebrated when he was a child. So we asked him what his Rathiatra cart looked like. And Prabhupada got a pencil and paper and he drew it. And this is his drawing of his own Rathiatra cart as a child. So in the Hare Krishna people, we tried to replicate this. This is our first film that we made, a half-hour documentary about the movement. So Prabhupada had incredible success throughout the world, reigniting genuine spiritual life. And then, as we know, as time went on, his body became weak and failed him. He returned to Vrindavan for the last few weeks of his life. And even then, he continued with this translation of Srimad Bhagavatam. This is also in the Hare Krishna film. Prabhupada very slowly says, everything is moving and acting according to the supreme direction of Krishna. This consciousness is Krishna consciousness. So these are some of his final breaths. His consciousness is so clear, although in his own words, his body was simply bones. And his appearance changed completely at that time, but still he remained fixed on Radha and Krishna and Krishna Balaram. Here he's taking darshan of the deities, and he remains so devoted to them. It's uh, an example all of us can take heart from and be inspired by. So I gathered, I spent many, many years gathering all my thoughts about this and came up with this memoir, 11, five years, 11 months, and a lifetime of unexpected love. So that is available for anyone who might be interested. And uh, we do have a few minutes. If there are any comments or questions, we can try to address those. Any reflections or thoughts? I'd be happy to hear those.
Perhaps we could have the lights, please. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Please. Well, did you see so many pictures that we, we had seen? I, you took all of the shots that you showed us tonight? Most of them, 90%. And uh, when you were explaining the circumstances, it, it added such a dimension that was so enriching. Mm -hmm. so Yes, please. Can I have a to write the letter so we will keep it tighter? Usually he would dictate to his secretary. The secretary would take notes and then type it up. And then probably would sign it. And on most of the letters at the bottom, you can see the initials of the secretary, John Sunder, Linda Dasty, whoever was taking the notes. So there would be some record who would take it. Are you planning to make some more films about Prabhupada? So many pictures, yeah. There, there must be 40,000 pictures of Prabhupada in the Bhaktivedanta archives. So. But um, we have no further plans at this moment for more films on Prabhupada. We're just distributing that one film, Hare Krishna film, right now. Um, as you travel with Prabhupada all across the world during the early days of the movement, um, I'm sure there were a lot of devotees that were still learning the ways of Krishna consciousness. How did Prabhupada respond when someone was doing something that wasn't exactly correct or the right way of doing something? How would he respond? So the question is, how did Prabhupada respond when inexperienced devotees were doing something quite properly? So it was very different. Sometimes, for instance, with Jamuna, who was one of his early disciples, he would be quite strict and reprimanding. And with others, he would be quite lenient. So it was really according to the capacity of the disciple to take chastisement or correction. It was not predictable. Uh, now, Jumuna explains that when Prabhupada went through his morning walk in Vrindavan, she had a team of devotees that would come in and clean his quarters in Vrindavan. And that was challenging because there's a lot of very fine dust in Vrindavan. It would be all over everything. So everyone was assigned different places to clean thoroughly. And Prabhupada came back from one morning walk and he opened a staple gun and he ran his hand inside the staple gun and held it up and it was full of dust. And he said, dust, don't you know how to clean? <laughs> so in that way, she took it as an inspiration because she was so amazing, amazingly clean. But for other devotees, they, could, they would be discouraged by that. So it was very individual. Do you know uh, what happened to the original Danda robots and also the original sketch of the, the theatrical? The sketch is in the archives. We submitted that to the archives, the archives. The Danda, I have no idea. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's something that some devotee somewhere would treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your yes. Um, uh, thank you very much. Can you recall any moments uh, that you had a photo of the two in uh, Melbourne and in the South India? Because we find most of them are like in America and yeah, I, I traveled with Mary, I explained yesterday, I'm sorry I didn't explain to you. I traveled with Prabhupada in the United States, Canada, Europe and India did not come to Australia. There was a devotee here in Amoga. Prabhu, who took pictures in Australia, so that was not so fortunate. Thank you so much for your attention. If you would like to take a book home, please do. I have just one question to yes. I'm interested that <coughs> from your experience, <coughs> when you were before Prabhupada with the camera, <coughs> uh, generally people pose. So did Prabhupada kind of, you know, was, it, was there any change in his attitude or approach when he was about to be photographed? Not at all. I explained yesterday there was one picture that he posed for. I showed that picture yesterday. But uh, except for the two that were, he was standing with a dunda. Somebody wanted a picture of him with his dunda. So there were two that were posed, and all the others were completely natural. There was no 
opposing at all. Not even slightly. Thank you so much for your attention. Please do take a book home. It's Christmas. <laughs> Thank you.